I want to just uh, uh, go over a few things before uh, Brianna takes over the meeting to go through the, uh, the bulk of uh, our business. Uh, one on the uh, website, uh, my office's website, uh, there is a non-New York State authorization form which you need to fill out um, whenever you submit to the office a proposal for a new program or a change in existing program. Uh, this form will give us um, some information. It asks uh, whether you have any activities with respect to any of the several triggers that uh, might uh, require us to get approval in a particular state. As I'm sure you all know by now, every state's different. Um, uh, every trigger is different. There are uh, variations. Um, uh, the common expression in the state authorization world is, it depends, uh, so um, that's the main thing. So it will ask uh, whether you're doing online, whether you have internships, uh, whether you're advertised, do have directed advertising in a particular state, uh, and so forth. So uh, it's very important that you fill that out. That's a requirement before we send a proposal to New York State for, uh, for approval. This also um, will uh, enable us to um, create a database so that we uh, get a good handle on everything that's uh, happening in, in NYU, if that's even uh, possible, but uh, we will uh, give it a, a best faith effort. Uh, so uh, again, appreciate your uh, uh, doing that. And the earlier you do that in the process, the better. Um, obviously, if the answer is no to everything, you don't have any of the activities, that's fine. But um, if it turns out you do have a particular activity, that will give Brianna time to, um, to get back to you about what might need to be done um, to figure out if, in fact, we um, uh, need to get uh, approval in a state that we don't have approval with uh, um, uh, and to um, for you to know where there might be limitations on uh, uh, where you can enroll students, where you can send uh, students to do internships and so forth. We, um, uh, the other point I want to um, uh, cover is um, uh, the re role of the school liaisons, that's all, all of you. Um, this is a complicated um, uh, field, as you know. Um, uh, and so the way we are organized is that uh, uh, Brianna has one uh, school liaison, one liaison in every school. That's her uh, con contact. And we're counting on uh, you folks to deal with uh, department chairs, faculty, and others in your schools um, with respect to questions that they may, they may have. Um, and uh, if you can't answer them, uh, for you to uh, for you to be the person who contacts uh, Brianna to get the information so that you can then give it back um, um, uh, to the folks in your school. Um, we, we are, we've been inundated with um, uh, questions, um, again, because this is so complex, so that um, keeping, keeping the arrangement to one uh, liaison in each school will make uh, us be able to operate more efficiently and to help you uh, 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 in a more efficient and expeditious uh, manner. So I think that's all that I wanted to say at this time. Again, we're glad everybody's here, and uh, let uh, Brianna take over now. I'm going to give an update on where NYU is for our compliance. So three years ago, when we joined in a room across the hall, <laughs> um, we were at 0% compliance, and we were all kind of putting our heads together to figure out, what is this? How are we going to navigate it? And today, um, we're at 75% compliance. So there are 81 state authorization agencies, and we've kind of triaged and gone through based on your list of priorities of what is important to you and our list of what is realistic and feasible for us, and we've, we've made it that far. We still do have a full intention of gaining um, 
gaining momentum and getting to 100% compliance, and the plan is to do that by 2018. So until then, we'll continue as we have been um, operating together, where there are certain states that certain activities will just have to be restricted for now, um, and you'll still be able to look to our internal website to get advisement on what can't happen where, and as we open up that activity for you, um, the website will be updated and we'll send out announcements so that you can um, stay in the loop with everything that we're doing on our end. <laughs> so in general, we've seen a trend of increasing regulatory changes and also just increasing activity from you guys. You guys are out there working hard, spinning your wheels, trying to do new innovative things for our students, and that's great. Um, but in general, it, it takes some time on our end to put those reports together. So like Russ said, having the one liaison helps us greatly to be able to just have one person call us and know who we should call to give the answer to instead of three or five people from your respective units. Um, so we've seen six agencies make um, changes to their regulations this year, and some of them were announced in the newsletter that we sent out last month. Um, but the two that weren't are on this list in Delaware and Oregon, we're adding to the list. Um, and we're seeing an increase in not only fees, but also the information that they're requesting and just the amount of paperwork that we need to put together to comply. So a great example is Oregon. Um, previously, they did not have distance education as a trigger for a need for authorization. And now, um, if you have an online program, you do need to comply in Oregon. And the fee used to be um, very small, nominal at best, and now it's $7,000. So um, that's the trend that they're following in addition to just more data requests where um, IR has been amazing in providing that for us for the applications, just asking how many students do you have enrolled who are resident of our state, um, how many faculty do you have who are teaching online programs who are resident of our state, that kind of information. So it is taking a little long to pull together, but um, we're, we're still staying on track in that area, which is great. And I just wanted to give an update on North Carolina. I know a lot of you have been calling and asking. It's a popular state for students to want to go to. North Carolina and Massachusetts seem to be the hot spots that kids get awesome opportunities in. And unfortunately, North Carolina has been restricted for us for some time. Last year when we had this meeting, we had a special um, breakout group that talked about if you want to apply in North Carolina, this is how we're going to work together to do it. And we have submitted those materials to North Carolina. And and we're waiting for um, the scheduling of our site visit. So everything's been in and reviewed that your teams work diligently to put together. And, and we're progressing on the path to compliance there to be able to open it up for our students. So we're just waiting on their office and checking in with them regularly to encourage the scheduling of that date. So as soon as we know, you guys will know. And hopefully it will be soon. <laughs> So I want to talk a little bit about um, something called SARA, and it stands for the State Authorization Reciprocity Agreement. And previously, um, I think some people at the end of these sessions had asked about it, but we really kind of skimmed the surface because New York wasn't eligible to join SARA, so it, it wasn't really relevant to us here at NYU. Since then, um, New York has become eligible, and we will be, New York State will be a SARA state in the near future, which means our university will have the opportunity to join. So I want to just give a high, broad level overview of what that means and what that is, because um, it'll, it'll mean some changes for state authorization. Um, the one thing that's really cute is a lot of the conferences that I go to, this, this little lady sitting on the table here with the blonde hair. Her name is Sarah, <laughs> and at the conferences, um, they handed her out, and she's appropriately dressed like Wonder Woman because she's supposed to kind of save the day for state authorization. So I brought her here today in honor of our discussion. <laughs> uh, but Sarah is a reciprocity agreement that policymakers have come together to try to say, you know, there's all these different regulations in different states. They all mean different things, and it's a lot of work, so can we streamline and have kind of a common application for this process? And schools that are doing well um, at at educating students and ethically and morally recruiting and um, you know kind of living like they're supposed to live they should you know kind of not have as much work to do to comply in this area so through the evolution of Sarah over the past seven years um, they've not been able to get one common thread that approves everything but they have been able to organize so that 
states join through regional compacts and then institutions in SARA states join through their state to be part of SARA. And it covers a lot of different things, um, but it essentially will not completely eliminate the need for state authorization because there are some states that are not members of SARA yet, so we'll still need to comply there. And then there are some activities that are not covered under the SARA agreement. So even if it's a SARA state, we might still need to seek some kind of approval there. So this is a map of um, Sarah's current status and um, kind of shows where, where Sarah is possible, where Sarah is not. They currently have 36 states as members and there are over 500 uh, institutions based in the US who are, have joined Sarah through their states. So it's definitely picking up momentum and, and gaining, gaining clarity there. What's covered and what's not covered by Sarah? So the list is literally five pages of very small font of what is and isn't covered. <laughs> so I just pulled out a couple high level things to give you an idea of what would and wouldn't be covered and I tried to focus on things that mattered for NYU. Um, so um, marketing and advertising was previously restricted in certain states until you saw approval. We'll no longer need to seek approval based on that trigger. So a lot of, um, a lot of the liaisons call me and say we're launching this new program, we wanna advertise it. Where can I and can't I advertise it? What are the rules? So that won't be an issue for us anymore once we join Sarah. Academic personnel, state of residence. Um, right now there are certain states that restrict having the ability to employ a faculty member who lives there. And I know a lot of the programs are doing more online learning and hiring really esteemed faculty that don't live in New York State or any of our surrounding states. And um, previously I think Georgia is one of the ones who's restricted for us. So once we join Sarah, in the SARA states that will open up for us. Proctored exams, I know this is an issue um, mostly for a lot of our student athletes that travel and their teachers make arrangements to take proctored exams, but also for some of the units that do have distance education offerings and they have some element of proctored exam offered within that. Um, there used to be states that restricted it and there still are, but if they're a member to SARA, we won't have to comply there anymore to, to be able to offer that to our students. And then distance education in general. Sarah states agree to a definition of physical presence and they agree that um, if you're a Sarah state and you're a Sarah institution offering education in that state to those residents, uh, you don't have to go through extra loopholes and applications to comply. Just offering distance ed to their residents is, is okay to them. So there are some major leaps that they've made that Sarah will make possible for us. So it'll decrease the workload in that area. But there are definitely things that aren't covered. So establishing physical locations. Um, at NYU, we have a satellite campus in Washington, D.C. You know, if D.C. were a Sarah state, would building a building there be covered? No. You know, you still have to do some, some work there from a regulatory standpoint. Um, and then the placement of students. So this is probably the biggest issue for everybody in the room. Where can our students go? Someone has a clinic, someone has a clerkship, someone has an internship. And all Sarah states agree that as long as the institution doesn't place more than 10 students at an individual site, um, there's no extra paperwork required. So that'll help all of us a lot because from the reports that we're seeing on our end of where your students are going, it's very rare that you have more than 10 students at the same site learning at one time. Um, so this will decrease a lot of the burden on your end um, to, to kind of keep up. And, and just in general, any regulated activity um, that's not in a SARA state. And then there's an element of professional licensure requirements. So any academic programs that lead to professional licensure, that element of licensure is not covered by SARA. So there's still extra regulatory work that we need to do for those specific programs. Which leads us to professional licensure, how appropriate. <laughs> so what about this? Why does it matter? Um, as we all know, licensed professions are very strict and they have a lot of requirements in addition to the basic things that we all do every day to make sure that our students are being educated and getting what they need to enter the employment fields that they desire to enter. There was a, a lawsuit recently with a school down south that's pretty large and prominent and they had enrolled a student in a nursing program and she was living in New York State at the time taking most of the nursing program at a distance with the university and when she graduated she got a job which is what we want all of our students to do <laughs> and when she got the job and she went to get her individual licensure with the Board of Nursing it was actually here in New York State <laughs> 
the Board of Nursing communicated with the Board of Ed and they realized that this school was not on the approved list to be offering nursing programs to residents of New York State. So they denied her application and she was told, we're sorry, you, you don't qualify to be a nurse in New York. Your school didn't get the appropriate approval and have a nice day, thanks for coming by. Uh, of course, that student in, in return called her school and was very upset, rightfully so, um, was trying to figure out what happened and essentially it evolved into a, a lawsuit where the student said, I can't accept the job, I have student loan payments, this is impacting the compounded interest on my 401k, I've already rented an apartment, I don't have income to pay my rent, um, and the university ended up settling outside of court with the student, um, but nonetheless, the licensure boards and the boards of higher education are getting very in tune to what's going on and, and really revving up on the consumer protection side of the house. And when things like this happen, it is impacting the school. And in this case, because they settled out of court, it didn't impact their brand. But if it had gone to court, the school's name would have been all over the Chronicle and all over inside higher ed. And their enrollments would have suffered significantly as well as the health of the program and kind of the ability to serve the students. So it's really an important issue that's bubbling up um, slowly, but we want to be proactive instead of reactive here at NYU to protect ourselves from anything like that. So within NYU in general, um, the structure for professional licensure is that the responsibility lives within the program. So our office does not secure professional licensure approvals on behalf of programs in other states. Um, so if you're going to do a program online, or if you have a program here on our traditional campus and your student wants to go to Washington State to complete her clinical, um, you know, that could potentially need approval from the licensure board in Washington State before the student's allowed to go there. Um, and we actually had um, uh, experience with this with the School of Nursing, and it is very difficult to do. It took months and hours worth of work, and I don't know, Eileen and Lena probably here, there they are in the corner, see them if you want to chat about this after, but um, essentially, you know, they had a student in nursing that wanted to go to Washington State to complete her clinical, and we started looking into what we had to do to make that possible for her. And the application process was grueling. Uh, it, was, it involved everything from the faculty member who was going to remain here and not physically go to Washington. Um, she had to be fingerprinted by an FBI approved agency. She had to take a seven hour learning engagement to prove that she you know, knew this information even though she wasn't the site supervisor in Washington State. So Lena and Eileen really jumped through a lot of hoops and, and did make it possible for the student. She's going to be able to go, but it was um, a, lot of, a lot of work. And in the Washington State for nursing, there was no cost, but for some of the states there is a cost. So if your program leads to professional licensure and you're thinking about students that are newly wanting to cross state lines and go do exciting things and just kind of keep in the back of your head you might want to check first with the licensure board to make sure um, that there's not an astronomical fee and that the work can be done before the student embarks on the placement. Um, in general, the role of our office with the intersection of securing licensure and licensure boards outside of New York State, there's an overlap um, because the licensure boards talk to the boards of higher education and they want to see the letter of approval. Um, before the student goes. So it's the school's job to secure that. Um, but for the first one, we're happy to review the application um, for you. We are able to do one workshop for school per school to talk through how to work with a licensure board and the kind of language that they want to see in the applications to make sure that your application is set up to be successful for approval. So we can do stuff like that for you and we can work together, but the, the majority of the work is housed within the school because it is so program specific that essentially um, it's not really stuff that our office could speak to at the end of the day either. And uh, we do have some general resources. I've actually put them in your folders for you today. There's two articles on professional licensure that were provided by WCET. It's an organization um, that has a state authorization network group and we're a member to it here at NYU and they provide resources that are really helpful. So I've printed those out and um, they're available on our website as well if you have further questions about licensure or just want to read more about it. So this year we were able to have our first round of our non-classroom experience reporting and data. And last year at this time we launched it and we had um, Rich Orb Austin come in and speak about tracking where our students are going, what they're doing, um, and, and just kind of get a 
hold on where everybody is and what's going on. And we've successfully launched that for our first year. It went really well. And we've hired a new graduate student analyst in our office, Su Young Song, who will join us up here to present the data. Um, she is a PhD candidate in the higher education and post-secondary program at Steinhardt. She recently joined our office as the graduate student research analyst. And prior to joining the team, Su Young worked as a researcher at Seoul National University's Institute for Social Development and Policy Research in South Korea. As part of her dissertation, she is conducting research on changing governance in higher education from a cross-national perspective. Um, so she's joining our team, and she's been really great, and she spent a lot of time working with the data that you guys spent a lot of time getting from your students. So today we're going to share with you the university-wide data and trends in the presentation, and then as you entered, if you were an identified um, school liaison, we did school-level reports specific to your school of where your students are going. Um, so if you have that and you want to follow along with what your students' trends are versus the university trends, you're welcome to do so. Um, our our school actually won an award this year for this program. The award is next to Sarah on the table. Um, and um, it went so well, and so many other schools are really struggling with how to keep track of where their students go and what they do. Um, that we were recognized for the great accomplishment. So um, thank you all for your hard work and a big thank you to Wasserman and the institutional research departments because um, they were really the ones that made the system possible. So I'll bring Sue Young up and she'll tell you a little bit about what we learned. Hi, um, I'm Sue Song. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Russ and Brianna for giving me this opportunity to work with amazing people in our office and um, participate in this research. Um, here I'm going to talk about the overall trend of non-classroom experience of NU students, including where are they going to complete their internship, externship, field experiences, and clinical and practicum um, inside and outside of the New York States, and how many students are seeking this activity in each school, and whether um, these experiences are credit-bearing components or general requirements for any program. Um, for the purpose of our report, um, we will use the term non-classroom experience to encompass all options. Um, the result for today is based on the report submitted through Wasserman Career um, Center Portal and direct report for each school. And we, were, we collected twice in spring of 2015 and summer 2015. And moving forward, we'll um, collect data three times a year. Um, and I really appreciate of those of you um, who already submit uh, our December 1st data um, for 2015 semester. Um, the, just to give a brief um, introduction of our data, um, the reported non-classroom experience in our data set include not only those that occurred very recently, but also um, experience that had completed several years ago. So for our analysis, um, first, we looked at states where NYU students are completing non-classroom experiences. Um, this map, it um, represents a geographic distri distribution of NYU students reported non-classroom experience um, between 2012 and 2015. Um, we can see that majority of non-classroom experiences completed in um, New York, New Jersey, and um, California. And this mirrors um, the result that um, Brianna just um, introduced to us um, about the Sarah map um, that NIU activities are um, occurring also in non Sarah states. Um, this result also shows that non classroom experience occurred throughout the states, including more than 35 states and also in um, non US location. Um, just to give you an example to understand more specifically of why we see this trends, um, the spike in Washington um, may seem a little bit strange, but considering the fact that Amazon headquarter is located in Washington, um, uh, you may think that many um, Stern students are there for that. Um, next, we also looked at the percentage of non-classroom experience engagement by semester. And this visual includes um, non-classroom experience that occurred during, the, during 2014 to compare when students are more engaging in these activities by semester. Um, based on the report, um, we were asked 
um, students to report their start date and end date of their activities. And based on this report, we broke down each semester, for example, spring from January 15 to May 15, summer from May 16 to August 31st, and fall semester from um, September 1st to um, January 14. Um, the result shows that um, more than 50% of students are completing their non-classroom experience during summer, 41% during fall, and 8% um, during, during uh, spring semester. Um, this result is really predictable um, since many students are um, using their summer period to complete their non-classroom experiences. Um, for, for example, Stern students, they, um, they take large portion of our data set around 750 observation, and they are more likely to do their internship during um, their summer term um, in align with their um, curriculums. And um, we hand in the school level report to you early of this conference, and please note that the individual school reports um, we indicated others as um, one category, and this represents non-classroom experience that were reported during the noted academic year, um, but actually occurred outside of the period during which the experience was reported. And um, this result also indicates a little bit of small number um, compared to the large size of our data. Um, because we specify the time period for each semester, but this actually decreases our sample size but increases the val validity of our result. Um, this is the uh, result of average length of non-classroom experience by semester. And the graph represents um, the length of days. Uh, we calculated the length of days by subtracting the start date um, from end date of the report activities. Um, we can see that in spring, the length of engagement range around 90 days, summer around 68 days, and in fall, 95 days. Uh, this result corresponds with the length of each semester, um, which is what we have predicted, and also shows that students are engaging significant amount of um, days for their non-classroom experience throughout each semester. Um, this visual depicts the frequency of non-classroom experience by NYU degree granting unit. You um, can see that the size of the visual um, represent the how big, how large students are going um, and are, are participating in non-classroom experiences. You can see that more than 700 um, students completed these activities in Stern um, and um, School of Professional Studies, more than 300 um, in College of Arts and Science, Dine Art, Tisch, and Silver. Um, and this result also reflects um, the bigger, I mean, the size of the school, that bigger schools have more students and they're more likely to have larger number of students who are engaging in um, classroom experiences. However, it also, I mean, it still nicely shows um, which schools are more or less involving in non-classroom activities um, in student learning. We also looked at um, the frequency of non-classroom experience by degree type. And this shows the size, um, I mean the word of the size, um, they show the relative frequency within the specified degree type. And um, we can see from the result that large number of undergraduate students are engaging in non-classroom activities compared to other um, degree types. Um, which kind of makes sense because a little more than half, one half of any enrollments are undergraduate. Um, master's students, many of them, they include students pursuing degree in Steinart, as, um, School of Professional Studies, GSAS, Tendon, and Nursing. They are also um, pretty much actively participating in non-classroom experiences. And MBA students as well, they 
take up large portion um, as majority of MBA students seek internship opportunity during um, summer term. Um, for now, um, I will pass over to Brianna for the remaining presentation. Um, I'm just going to go through a few more results. So one of the things that we looked at was whether the non-classroom experiences are required or optional for program completion. And some of you may remember three years ago when we were trying to collect data on the programs here at NYU. And this is something that sometimes matters for state authorization compliance. Some states don't care, and some states say, well, if it's required, you know, we need to know about it. So North Carolina, which we're in the process of the application right now, they're a state that cares about the required non-classroom experiences. So this was our first chance to extract data from where the students are actually going, and, and it made sense to us that about 26% of the reported experience were required for program completion, because when we did the count last year, there were about 58 programs at NYU that had required non-classroom learning components to them. We also looked at whether the um, completion of the non-classroom experience was for credit or not for credit. This is something else that matters for compliance and for reporting to different states. Um, so this was really interesting for us to see and again fell in line with the data that we collected from you guys last year on how many of the non-classroom experiences or programs that you offer are for credit or not for credit. We looked at the type of non-classroom experience, um, and this actually didn't matter for compliance, but it was something a lot of the units expressed was interesting to them and they wanted to look at, and also something that our career center um, focuses on, just what are the students doing, where are they going. Um, so the large majority of the placements were internships and externships, and kind of trickles down from there for part-time jobs, career-related volunteer positions clinical practicums, and, and so forth. Um, one question that comes up a lot when we're working on compliance is, well, if I don't call it an internship, does it still matter? Can we just change the label of the experience and get away without doing the paperwork? And unfortunately, uh, the states you know, don't really care what it's called. A learning experience is a learning experience, regardless of the label. Um, so this is interesting for us to look at and to watch trends in higher education and see how people are labeling these learning engagements. Um, but irregardless of the title, you'll still have to do the paperwork and comply. <laughs> We also looked at the frequency of paid and unpaid learning engagements. Um, and this is something that for a small amount of states does matter. If your students are getting income for the, the learning engagement, they might want to know about it. Um, so it was kind of interesting just kind of in the climate of higher education policy in general. I don't know if you guys have been reading about gainful employment and you know free labor from the student population. So it was, it was nice to see that there's actually kind of a 50-50 split between paid and unpaid. I think there's, um, the numbers are a little higher than what some of the newspaper alludes to that we all read, um, which is nice. And, and that's the case at NYU, but not every school. But what's interesting is if we drill down a little further on this data point and we segment by school, um, you can really see which schools are sending their students to do these engagements that are compensated versus not compensated or in a form of a grant scholarship or stipend versus not. Um, so again, you know, the, the data, like Su Young said, different larger schools we have more data for, which makes sense because there's just more students in them. <laughs> um, but nonetheless, the proportion of paid versus unpaid is, is interesting. So looking forward, um, the non-classroom experience data, this was our first time collecting it and working with it. I think we got a lot of interesting things, I think especially looking at the school level reports that Young was able to create. Um, some of the school level reports are in alignment with the university-wide data, and some are really different. Um, some of the students are going for a lot longer than the average student. You know, they're in the 120s, 130s for the number of days that they're engaging. And some are on the other end, 20, 30 days. So in your respective programs, I'm sure you could reflect and probably know immediately why. Maybe it's that you require a month-long learning engagement, uh, so it makes sense to you that for your program it's hovering around 30 days instead of 80. Um, there are other things, some of the reports had kind of a smaller number. Um, some of the smaller schools had single or double-digit 
student numbers engaging in learning experiences and maybe that makes sense to you because you know exactly how many kids are in your program and it's perfectly in alignment but maybe it's something that you look at and think that's weird I know I have more than 22 students doing learning engagements so maybe it's a time to reflect and kind of think how we could better extract this data from the units to really get a whole picture of, of the robust activity that's happening within your respective school. I think that there's also a lot of um, room for improvement on what we do um, in the future. So some of the data we might shift, it took a lot to clean it. We had a lot of options for those of you that use the template and are familiar with the, the questions that we asked and the options we had for responses. Uh, we might condense those a little bit because um, we ended up just collapsing them for data purposes. So a lot of the responses you filled in on your forms you didn't see here, so we might kind of simplify that a little bit for you. And then, um, in general, there's some future directions that are exciting. We, in scanning the data, we saw that there were a lot of non-classroom experience engagements that students were going to year after year. So if they did it one summer, they might have showed up in the portal again another summer with the same employer. So that's a testament to how well our students are performing in, in these experiences. The employers are liking them, they're doing a good job, their writing skills, their verbal skills, whatnot, are really in alignment with what they're looking for, and they liked them so much that they're bringing them back and re-engaging them. And then future directions, I think, especially for Wasserman, it would be interesting to look at where the student did the non-classroom engagement and where they end up getting their first job after graduation. Because uh, a lot of times there's a high correlation, especially in professional fields, with where you land, where you generate your first paycheck after you've achieved your education. So those are kind of future directions that we're just beginning to think about that are exciting. Um, in general as well, um, Becoming 100% compliant, like we said in the beginning, is still a priority to us, and we're still going to support you in individual states. If you look at the website and see that something re is restricted and you have a student that really needs to go there, um, it's worth a phone call to our office to ask if we can make that possible. Sometimes our hands are tied and the regulators aren't making exceptions, but sometimes if it's for one student and her parent, his or her parent is sick and they need to go home to live closer for that semester, the regulator will allow for an exception so that we can make that possible. Um, we're going to be looking to join Sarah, and we'll keep you posted on the progress. Right now, we've been working with the State Department in New York to figure out what the timeline for that will look like. They still haven't set a fee for what they'll charge to join, but they recently did survey us to ask what we'd be willing to pay to join. <laughs> so the ball is rolling, and um, as soon as we have more information on that, we'll definitely share it with you. Um, another thing that's on our radar is global regulations. A lot of you have started calling the office saying, you know, I have an online enrollment from Brazil. Can I accept them? And think, you know, it aligns with state authorization. What's the restrict in, restriction? Do you have more information on this? And um, this is kind of a hot topic in the industry in general right now. And there are some restrictions or regulations that we do need to be aware of. So we've been working with our general counsel to partner with Cooley, um, an external law firm that specializes in this area of higher education compliance. And we've gotten our first report from them of 12 priority countries to begin to navigate that space. Um, as one-offs, we've been working with your units to modify the language and enrollment agreements to make the enrollment requests that you currently have possible. Um, so, um, for example, for Brazil, there was some issue with potential tax penalties or something. So there was some disclaimer language that legal helped us craft to put into the enrollment agreement so that the school was protected from, you know, having a, to eat the cost of something that they didn't know about when they entered into the agreement. Um, so things like that are what, what we're working on moving forward and what we'll keep you in the loop on as we progress and learn more about them ourselves. And um, in general, we have a lot of exciting things going on in our office to leverage technology to be more efficient. So the form that Russ brought up earlier in the presentation, uh, the non-New York State Authorization form that you complete when you submit a new program or program change request, um, we're working to kind of make that more of an interactive tool and we're partnering with the GovLab at NYU to do that. And um, we've been able to begin work on that so that it won't be the case that you just answer and it goes into a database and it's three weeks or a month before we have time to call you back. Um, it'll be something more like uh, a TurboTax where you submit an answer and you get a response of what that answer means so that you don't have to wait for the one person, me, <laughs> in the office <laughs> to, uh, to bring you back and explain to you what should be on your radar as you progress with your curriculum planning. 
Um, and then some of you may have learned about the advisor that our unit's been tasking on to help navigate state authorization policies. And that's what the panel will be about um, after we adjourn the formal meeting session, um, just kind of how we're leveraging technology to navigate the policy landscape and the innovation that's within that tool and the potential that it has that's really exciting. Um, so that's all the the juicy stuff for today. Um, maybe we can have some time for question and answer, and if anybody wants to take a break to get um, a refreshment in the back of the room, there's some food and drinks, you're welcome to it. And then we'll kind of come back together and begin our panel session in about five or 10 minutes. Does anybody have any questions? Caddy? Um, just looking at the Sarah. So, um, I assume the idea is that we all, these states, will be part of SARA eventually. So, are we impacted by the timing of those who are still not SARA states? Do you have any sense of what's the long term outlook of the one that would take for everybody to become under contract? That's a great question. So Caddy had asked about um, the Sarah states and the reality of what's going on with the states that aren't Sarah states. Do we know when they will become a Sarah state and how does that impact the, the individual schools? So as soon as we join, we'll, we'll create a more comprehensive summary of the precise impact that it has on your unit. Um, we do have the data on the activity you guys have going on, so we'll be able to cater it um, so that you don't have to weed through a bunch of stuff that's irrelevant to you. If you're a school without distance education, you're not gonna have to read the portion about distance education kind of thing. Um, but what it essentially will mean are, for example, four schools with distance education, if they previously had a restriction for enrollment in that state and it's a SARA state, they'll no longer have to restrict once we're a SARA member. So we'll have um, more customized reports about how that will impact you so that you have clear guidance so that you don't feel like you're in danger of being non-compliant or making a mistake because it's a new territory. Um, but for the non sara states, what's interesting in terms of the timeline for when they will be sara states, um, the New England region, where you see the majority of the white space on this map, does not have a regional compact that serves the, the area. So the, I guess if, if I had a map of it, it would look like you just made four slices and each quadrant would be part of this higher ed regional compact. But there's a, a giant gray space in the New England area because years ago when these compacts were formed, the New England states decided to not participate in the compact joining. And when Sarah was being launched and they decided to kind of go nationwide, they decided to go through the portal of a regional compact. So the reason why all the states in the New England area which we're smack dab in the middle of, unfortunately, are, um, are all not participating is because they actually need to have a legislative organization make a statement and an agreement that they can join a regional compact, after which they need to usually have a signature from a governor, appropriation of funding, and begin to get infrastructure in place to support SARA. So, um, it's a longer timeline for the states that are in white. There's also some states whose legislatures only meet twice a year instead of once a year. So if the Sarah folks just missed the boat on lobbying them to participate, it's a two-year wait before they can begin to have that conversation because it's not called into session. Um, so there's there's multiple reasons, but pretty much um, the states that currently are not SARA members, we're not gonna see them becoming SARA members in the next two weeks, three weeks, four weeks. It's gonna be a longer haul of anywhere between nine months to a year and a half before they, they participate. Um, and I think a couple states just have kind of a difference of opinion. Uh, North Carolina is very heavily regulated. We know that because we just went through the process with the application being much more extensive and the fee being much higher than the other states. So um, they're a little more reluctant than the state that has a one-page application and a $50 fee to kind of give up that quality, what they think is a quality control measure um, to offer education to their students. So we'll definitely communicate with what that means for, for example, for Wagner where Capstone can go or, um, you know, for Tandon where your online enrollments can come from. You guys all have unique cases um, due to the decentralized nature that makes NYU so great. Um, so we'll definitely find a way with our reports to accommodate that. In the back. Does Sarah apply and the other compliance to continuing education and non-credit learning classes as well? 
Um, yeah, the question was, does SARA apply to continuing education offerings and non-credit offerings as well? That's a great question. I didn't anticipate that for today. So I will have a homework assignment to go research that for you. But I'll, um, we'll do a follow-up to the email to send out some links, and I'll make a note to, to send out the answer to that question as well, because I know that's something that a lot of the schools are doing more of um, and kind of entering that space of non-credit offering, continuing education units, online learning um, with partners that may not be for credit. So I'll definitely do a little digging and make sure that we have a comprehensive answer for you. Thank you.